in 1940, Hitler's failure to defeat the RAF and British victory in the Battle of Britain was decisive. Let us never forget the words of Churchill's tribute to the RAF, the men who won the Battle of Britain when Britain stood alone. Never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. A few months later, the Luftwaffe began its bombing campaign against Britain. After heavy German daylight bombing losses, raids were switched to night operations. The Blitz witnessed destruction and death on the home front, where heavy and frequent bombing raids destroyed many towns and cities. Although Britain and the RAF's defensive strategies were underway, a war of intelligence and countermeasure was being fought. This story is about an often unknown measure that was set up to counter these devastating bombing raids on Britain. For the first part of my journey, I have come to the RAF Air Defence Radar Museum in Norfolk, which sits next to RAF Neatishead. What once was a fully operational air defence station, established in 1941. RAF Neatishead was just one of the many stations that helped detect enemy aircraft from Nazi-occupied Europe, launching raids against military and industrial targets in Britain. As ground control intercept stations, these bases utilise the use of radio waves to detect objects beyond the range of sight, a piece of technology that had been developed during the 1930s. This equipment, known as radar or radio detection and ranging, played a major and incredibly important role during the Second World War. The RAF Air Defence Radar Museum tracks the use of radar in history. With over 20 rooms to explore, the museum hosts a range of exhibitions and displays. Some of these include the early development of radar, a cockpit of a tornado aircraft which were used in more recent missions like Operation Grapple in 1993, a nuclear reporting cell established in 1957 to warn the public, government and military of an impending nuclear attack, and an impressive Cold War operations room, demonstrating some of the equipment and machinery used to intercept Soviet aircrafts. When you walk into this room, it is very easy to imagine it humming with activity at the height of the Cold War. But this operations room is of course a far cry from the days of the Second World War. However, the use of radar during the 1940s shows how it was used to protect Britain picking up incoming enemy aircraft at a range of 80 miles. This technology was incredibly important as it gave air defences early warnings of attacks and allowed Britain to accurately direct RAF fighters day or night to attack enemy aircraft. The use and importance of radar is relatively well known and rightly acknowledged in Britain, like here at the Radar Museum. But it wasn't just knowing when and where the raids would take place. What if Britain could disrupt the technology used by the Luftwaffe that actually helped them fly accurately towards their target? After interrogating a captured Luftwaffe pilot and piecing other elements of intelligence together, by March 1940, Britain had concrete evidence that German scientists were developing a system of intersecting radio beams sent out from bases in Europe. These beams could indeed accurately guide planes towards targets in Britain. Before the Battle of Britain in May 1940, the Luftwaffe sent planes over nighttime Britain, 
not in mass formations as expected, and of course as seen in the Battle of Britain itself, but single planes flying at great heights. Although first believed to be just testing Britain's defensive response, we now know that it was a series of exercises carried out by the Luftwaffe crews to prove early forms of technological warfare. This technology used by the Germans originally worked by a radio beacon sending a signal down the centre line of a runway consisting of a series of dots and dashes. An aircraft tuned into this frequency would detect the signal. If the plane was too far left of the beam, the pilot would hear a series of dots. And if the plane was too far right of the beam, the pilot would simply hear a series of dashes. But as the plane was flying down the centre line of the runway, the dots and dashes overlapped, creating one continuous note known as equisignal. As the plane got closer to the runway, the beam became narrower, so allowed the pilot to fly more accurately and could carry out a landing. When listening to the signal, the pilot knew he was either to the left of the runway, to the right of the runway, or perfectly lined up with it. This technology was called the Lorenz Blind Landing System. German Dr. Hans Plendel created a way to use the Lorenz system by essentially turning it around the other way by sending the beam out from Germany towards a target in Britain. Plendel built two large transmitters to send these beams. The first was in Cleve in Germany, near the Dutch border. A Luftwaffe plane could follow this beam for their direction towards a target in Britain. For example, if the target was a factory in Derby, the Luftwaffe pilot would follow the centre line towards this location. The pilot would need to know when they got there, so an additional beam was sent from Plendel's second transmitter to give the range. This second transmitter was in Bredstedt, in North Germany near the Danish border. These two cross-directional beams allowed the Luftwaffe pilot to know exactly when to drop the bomb when they were over the chosen target. These radio beams were called Nickerbein or Crooked Leg. Nickerbein was used by the Germans early on in the bombing campaigns against Britain. But between August and November 1940, this technology had been developed further into two new methods that were being used as navigational aids to pinpoint targets in the dark. The use of these technologies allowed German planes to drop bombs accurately on specific targets from the air. It was these new systems of targeting that the Luftwaffe used on the infamous bombing raid on Coventry on the 14th of November 1940. After further investigation, it was certain that the Germans were using cross-directional beams to pinpoint targets. This was a dreadful prospect, because it was so widely available to the Germans, every Luftwaffe plane had a beam transmitter. Although the use of radar and other conventional methods like wartime plotting tables were incredibly important, scientific intelligence expert Dr. R. V. Jones got to work in creating a more specific countermeasure to protect Britain from this particular threat. RAF 80 Signals Wing was set up as a countermeasure, with numerous sites around the country being established near to sites of importance. One site was here, Charlie in Leicestershire, just north of Colville, where I am today, being close to the important manufacturing centres of Coventry and Derby, which would likely be targets of Luftwaffe bombing raids. Derby was home to the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine factory that made engines for the famous Spitfires and Hurricanes. I have come to this RAF 80 wing outstation to meet Terry Shepherd, a local historian and part of the Charlie Heritage Group who look after and maintain the site today. The outstation here at Charlie 
was strategically situated under the beams that would be tracking across the country to get to Birmingham, which was jam-packed with armaments factories. Also, a little way to the north is the town called Derby, which is stacked with Rolls-Royce factories, many of which were making the famous Merlin engine that was powering our Spitfires, Hurricanes and some of our later bombers. Little remains of the site now, with the only evidence being a brick blast wall that sheltered a communications van with its power generator. The communications van itself would have been placed inside this section of this small structure, and then the power generator would have sat next door in this area. But what's impressive is that a small detachment of specialist wireless operators man the site in secret. They would broadcast counter beams on very similar frequencies which confused the receiving Luftwaffe bomber crews as they neared a target. When a Nazi plane thought it was dropping bombs on London at night, it was in actual fact dropping them in fields in Surrey. Well, in the 1940s, here was a, a grass field, a pasture field, full of the sheep owned by Mount St. Bernard's Abbey. The field was rented from Mount St. Bernard's Abbey. In it, they put a number of structures, three small sheds, a big shed, headquarters shed in the middle, and this brick structure, a uh, glass wall structure that's still here today. The first shed was designed to combat the Nicobine threat. Now, the Nicobine threat wasn't called that because we wanted to keep it secret from the Germans, so we called it a headache. And what do you do with a headache? You give it an aspirin. Uh, the transmitter was called an aspirin. Two of other of the small sheds were designed to cope with a later threat called excorat, uh, codenamed ruffians. Of course, what do you do when you've got a bunch of ruffians? You give them a bromide. So the, the transmitter was called bromide. Now, in the, inside this brick structure that's still here today, there was a, a trailer. And inside the trailer was the third transmitter. And that was designed to combat the Weigerat threat. The Weigerat threat was nicknamed Benito after Mussolini, that thorn in the Allies side. And they, they called the transmitter by an old fashioned pun, Benjamin, Benjamin. In the battle of measure and countermeasure, the Nazis continued to develop more sophisticated beam systems to help drop bombs accurately. Opposing these, the RAF-80 wing units, like the ones here at Charlie, continued their job of jamming and distorting the beams after they had worked out the appropriate responses. Why was 80 wing important in winning the war? Uh, that's been debated a lot. Uh, it was certainly true that the Germans had to combat the gross interference with their, with their flying that was put up by 80 wing and they never felt that they could roam freely over this country and play havoc with our industrial capacity, our docks and our cities. The, the uh, freedom to roam our skies was taken away from them. Not only has Terry shed light on the RAF 80 wing units and the outstation here at Colville, he shares his experience meeting a soldier who was once stationed here. Well, I'm a very fortunate local historian. When we as the Charlie Heritage Group were working on this project, we got to meet one of the wireless mechanics that was actually here in the war. His name was Ken Nichols. And I had the privilege of going to his house once. And in his house, when I was sitting there recording what, he, what I had to say, there was a picture on the sideboard of his wife, who was subsequently died most beautiful looking woman. And then he told me all about her, how he met her. And he said him and his mate, who were on, who were minding the aspirin transmitter in the shed up at the top of the field, um, they were leaning on the gate 
drinking tea, you know, like airmen do. And walking up the road were two girls who'd been on a nursing type of, a caring type of uh, appointment. They're walking up the hill, going back home to Colville. And of course, you know what RAF men do, they chat them up. And uh, what came out of that was a dance date at the local hop at Colville. And before the war ended, those two were hitched. Um, we, uh, in much later times, when it was, when it was the times when we had open days here, uh, we wanted to remind everybody of that fact. And we got him to come, Ken Nichols, very doddery at that time. And we dug a hole and planted a brand new cherry tree in the ground to celebrate that wonderful moment where he met his wife. It was operations like these, often unknown today, that helped contribute to the protection of Britain, meaning less lives were lost and the war effort could continue. These efforts helped play a pivotal part in how the Allies won the Second World War. <laughs>